Hello and welcome to this Chatham House webinar in association with the Atlantic Council, looking at the Rohingya crisis three years on. It's three years since an exodus of Rohingya people from Myanmar took place. And so we're taking this point to reflect on the current situation, international responses, and particularly in the light of the, of the COVID epidemic. We're joined by four panelists, Ellen Stensrud, researcher from the Norwegian Center for Holocaust and Minority Studies. Rudaba Shahid, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Claire Smith, lecturer in the Department of Politics at the University of York. And Susanna Williams, also at the Department of Politics at the University of York. So without further ado, please let me turn to Ellen Stensrud for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Garrett. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers at Chatham House for inviting me to join this, this very timely and hopefully interesting event. In my presentation, what I would like to do is to address one of um, what we often see as the root causes of the persecution of the Rohingya. And through this, I want to, to point to some major issues at stake when it comes to the future of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, this is partly actually to, to sort of remind ourselves and not lose sight of what lies beneath the crimes against the, the Rohingya. The UNHCR has stated that repatriation of Rohingya to Myanmar uh, must be voluntary, safe and dignified. And it is my argument that this is not possible without keeping some of these root causes in mind and trying to address them. Many observers of the Rohingya situation have stated that citizenship is at the heart of their plight. And although we can discuss what are the main contributors or underlying factors, I think this um, concept, of, concept of citizenship is, is crucial. Uh, so I want to spend my presentation expanding on that. First, I want to say a little bit about how citizenship is defined in Myanmar. Um, Citizenship rights in Myanmar are ethnically, or uh, one might use the term racially based. According to the 1982 citizenship law, only those belonging to ethnic groups who settled um, in the territory uh, of what is now the Union of Myanmar before 1823 are by definition considered citizens of birth, which is the highest category of citizenship. Further, a list of 135 national races um, defines those groups who are eligible for citizenship. Uh, the Rohingya, for many reasons, are not on this list and they are not mentioned as one of the national groups in the citizenship law. And consequently, they, cannot, they can only be granted citizenship if they can document a family lineage uh, in Myanmar for several generations, which is, of course, uh, often impossible or extremely difficult because such documentation may be lacking or, or just has been lost. And these citizenship verification processes in the past have been uh, very slow and uh, not very credible. So ethnicity, uh, which again is linked to notions of territorial belonging and ancestry, um, is therefore essential to citizenship in Myanmar. And, my argument, and I think many will <laughs> agree with me on this, is that this knot must be untied for the Rohingya to have a future in Myanmar, but it is extremely sensitive and contentious and a broader discussion about the link between ethnicity, historical belonging and a, a wide scope of political rights is difficult for many, reason, many reasons. And first of all, it is difficult because in Myanmar, the recognition of national ethnic group status implies certain political rights. Uh, for example, a uh, fight for ter ter territorial or political autonomy is often is linked to ethnicity um, and demands for rec recognition as an ethnic national group in Myanmar are associated with political claims and are therefore highly contentious. So one reason why um, the authorities in Myanmar and the population in general do not recognize the existence of the Rohingya as a group is because um, that would potentially legitimize wider political demands down the road. So um, the group's right to self-determination is therefore ignored. Um, another uh, 
reason why it is extremely difficult to address the issue of ethnicity is simply because um, ethnicity is uh, in many ways uh, protecting uh, the minority groups. Many ethnic groups see that they, there is protection and recognition in being on this list on 100, of 135. Um, and for larger uh, ethnic groups, territor a territorial homeland, um, and the ethnicity uh, linked to that homeland is the organizing principle for their political demands. So their fight for political rights um, often take the form as a fight for ethnic rights. Um, and the recognition as a national ethnic group is therefore essential. And these are one or are two of the, the reasons why it is so extremely difficult to, to address the issue of citizenship and ethnicity in Myanmar. And added to this, of course, the uh, liberalization since 2011 has contributed to a surge in ethno-nationalism. So my um, sort of message <laughs> in this presentation today is that uh, I think amidst all the humanitarian concerns that are essential, of course, and will be addressed, I think, by, by some of the other speakers, uh, we must keep drawing attention to, to some of the root causes uh, of the atrocities committed against Rohingya. Um, I think if the question of citizenship is not addressed and guaranteed, there can be no such thing as a safe uh, return for the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, because the forced expulsion of the Rohingya from Rakhine was ultimately an expression of the fact that they were not seen as members of the political entity that is Myanmar. Um, so opening up this entity for the Rohingya is essential, but at the moment it is uh, very difficult to envisage how that will happen. And uh, I am not very optimistic that such a discussion about, about ethnicity and citizenship can take place in Myanmar in the foreseeable future. Okay, uh, thanks to the Atlantic Council and um and Chatham House for jointly organizing this. And um, I will start off my presentation by giving you an overview of the situation in the Rohingya refugee camps in Cox's Bazar of Bangladesh, where this pandemic has created lots of challenges. If we consider the density in the camps, which is about three times that of Manhattan, and each shack in the camps on average having about 10 square meters and typically housing six to uh, five to six people, we can easily understand the social distancing guidelines stated internationally are quite hard to follow. The first case of COVID-19 was detected in mid-May and a Yale University study has shown that 25% of respondents have uh, experienced at least one symptom of the virus, dry cough, fever, and so on. It has also been reported that due to the fear of potential separation from family members, uh, refugees normally do not reveal their symptoms and instead buy medications from local pharmacies for self-treatment. Testing is very low, which by the way is very low in South Asian countries generally. Uh, India is doing uh, 40 tests per thousand, Pakistan is doing 13 tests per thousand and Bangladesh is doing 10 tests per thousand. On the other hand, the US is doing 291 and the UK is doing 237 tests per thousand. So in the Rohingya camps, um, as of August 24th, only 3,176 tests have been conducted among the refugees and uh, 79 of them came out positive, indicating a 2% infection rate. This is much lower than the uh, rate found in the host population, which is approximately 16%. However, the death rate, on the other hand, is 8%, while for the host population is 2%. In case of an outbreak in the camps, healthcare facilities are inadequate to handle a severe public health crisis. As of mid-August, isolation centers have been set up with around 800 beds for camp residents, and there are only two ventilators in the whole of Cox's Bazaar, which is not just for, um, for the, the refugees, but also for the host community uh, living outside. So one good thing so far is 3G and 4G internet have been restored in the refugee camps in Bangladesh. So the refugees can now get um, updated news on COVID-19. During this time, many have tried to escape this situation and have been turned away from certain countries in Southeast Asia where 
boats carrying refugees arrived when boats carrying refugees arrived on their shores. So let us talk about a few things that can be done in the short term and the long term, other than maintaining hygiene and uh, washing hands, which local and international NGOs have been emphasizing upon. So the first thing in terms of the short term, I would be talking about funding. So I would like to point out that the international community must provide timely financial support to the government of Bangladesh to manage this crisis. So from a report from last year, up until August 2019, the international community uh, had only provided $330 million out of the promised $920 million for that year. I haven't come across a report uh, for this year, but it must be emphasized that uh, for such a crisis, funding needs to arrive on time. The international community should also place immediate sanctions on Myanmar, as Ellen has been talking about all these ethnicity and citizenship issues not only affect the Rohingyas, but also many other ethnic groups. So if the repatriation of the Rohingyas is to happen, uh, eventually happen, experts believe that only a strong stance by regional and global powers can help pressurize Myanmar to change its behavior and give this persecuted community full citizenship rights. Sincere support of regional powers such as China and India are also crucial. In the long term, well, the continued uh, violence in uh, the Rohingya state suggests that we have to look at other, um, other solutions. So uh, one thing is to consider repatriate, uh, other than repatriation is resettlement into uh, third countries. So in the long run, it is imperative that the international community makes an active effort in resettling, uh, resettling uh, Rohingyas to third countries. Perhaps the OIC, the Organization for Inter um, Islamic Cooperation, can help Bangladesh to look into this proactively. One good example from South Asia in terms of third country settlement is the case of the Lotshampa refugees, uh, where approximately 100,000 Bhutanese refugees lived in uh, refugee camps in southern Nepal in the 90s and how um, and have been largely settled into uh, third countries such as the UK and the US. Of course, this is a much smaller population we're talking about, but this is a successful case of um, resettlement in a third country overseen by the UNHCR. So also, I would like to add that in the long uh, term, Bangladesh uh, government, the Bangladesh government might consider uh, amendment, uh, amendment to its COVID-19 uh, bill. It, um, and in doing so, it should consider the host community as well as the uh, Rohingya refugees living in Cox's Bazar. Um, UNDP study last year estimated that the price for essential goods had increased by uh, 50%, while daily wages have decreased by 15% in Cox's Bazar. So uh, most countries have not included refugees in their COVID-19 bill, but due to the protracted nature of this crisis, it is imperative that the Bangladesh government at least considers in the long run in doing so. Um, and um, finally, if, um, if and when we do get a vaccine for COVID-19, there should be active efforts to vaccinate the population living in the refugee camps as soon as possible, because an outbreak there might offset any vaccination programs in uh, the rest of uh, South Asia. And to my previous point, I might uh, want to add that, uh, you know, this ongoing pandemic has aggravated tensions between the Rohingya refugees and the host community living outside. So any kind of, you know, uh, short term uh, solutions, uh, you know, uh, in terms of them having a mutual relationship with people living, living outside the camps would include, uh, you know, um, ha keeping everybody happy. So, um, so, you know, the COVID-19 bill is something that I would like to emphasize upon because there are a lot of people joining us today from uh, Bang the Bangladesh establishment and uh, embassies and high commission um, officials are also joining us. Uh, so I would like to stop here and uh, we'll answer queries uh, during the Q&A session. And thank you uh, to Ellen for making this easier for me uh, to move on. And uh, over to you, Claire and Susie. Thank you so much, um, Ellen and Rudabe, for setting things out. Um, and thanks again to, the, to Chatham House and the Atlantic Council for hosting us. So Susanna Williams and I from the University of York, we're going to be talking about... Um, some research we've been doing for a um, 
forthcoming paper with the journal Global Responsibility to Protect that in a special edition that Ellen, our colleague here, is, is co-editing. And our research um, builds on, on, on the work done by some important scholars who've been looking at the role of Southeast Asian states, and in particular Indonesia, in responding to the Rohingya crisis. Um, so rather than looking at the root causes of the crisis, as Ellen has laid out, um, and some of the enduring problems and the current status um, of the refugees that Rudabe has been highlighting, our focus is rather on the unique role that Indonesia has been playing in terms of how it's responded to the crisis via what's been dubbed quiet diplomacy. Now, Indonesia is in a unique position, both regionally and internationally, given that it's the largest Muslim majority state in the world, a very close ally of Myanmar in the region, a core member of ASEAN, um, the regional association, a member of the OIC, which has been very active um, on this crisis, and of course is currently a member of the UN Security Council. So it has a very strategic role to play here. Um, and importantly, it bridges all of these different fora who have an interest in, in the Myanmar crisis in relation to the Rohingya. And we found in our research that there have been four key sets of values and interests that have played a role in formulating the quiet diplomacy approach under the leadership of President Jokowi. And three of these we find have played the most important role due to a combination of domestic and regional pressures and interests. Um, and so I'll highlight two of these and then Susanna will come on to focus on, on two more. And we'll briefly go through each of these values, highlighting their contribution to Indonesia's response, as well as how it's been constrained in terms of how it's responded. Um, and the main activities that Indonesia's engaged with in terms of the crisis, which reflects and the way that they've engaged reflects um, finding some sort of middle path between these competing values. And as such, they've focused very much on humanitarian assistance, supporting technical capacity building in partnership with the Myanmar government and mediation between parties, especially local parties involved in the crisis via their good, good offices. So on the first point um, on domestic politics, this um, the role of um, particular national values, political values in determining Indonesia's response has been very um, important. These principles of national sovereignty, non-interference and the protection of territorial and integrity have really underpinned um, Indonesia's position. Indonesia's experience of going through a military to democratic transition where the military has been kept on side, very much uh, in parallel with Myanmar's case, has meant that as part of the process of that transition, the military retains a great deal of influence, even if not within the formal political sector, certainly as an active player in politics. Um, and the military cannot be sidelined, therefore, in any decision making, both on peace building nationally and in Indonesia's approach regionally and internationally. Now, that position underpins um, their national model of peace building that they use in their own domestic conflicts and helps guide their focus in terms of this particular crisis by focusing on economic development, humanitarian assistance, technical reforms, capacity building and so forth, rather than political and civil reforms. So not addressing the issues that Ellen raised around citizenship, but more responding to how to work with the military and the government in terms of perhaps influencing how they address these problems. Um, and Indonesia's position is very much as a, as a as seeing itself as a, a part of the ASEAN family with Myanmar and treating Myanmar as a state undergoing a parallel transition. So working with it and not in overt public criticism of it. Now that underpins the second set of values, which is of course the ASEAN framework um, and what's known as the ASEAN way, which is um, not uh, working um, against Myanmar, but working with it via technical cooperation, capacity building, diplomatic engagement and facilitation. These are some of the key methods and approaches that are used by Indonesia via ASEAN. Um, this one family approach as various officials have called it. So that is you keep criticism of the situation within ASEAN fora and do not take that too overtly publicly. And that's seen as the most effective mode of building these relations with Myanmar and trying to work with them from the inside. So I'll now hand, end, hand over to Susie to reflect on the other two critical sets of values. Thank you. 
Um, so the third set of values that we found has influenced Indonesia's foreign policy towards Myanmar has been um, Islamic humanitarianism, which has mainly come from domestic pressure from Islamic groups, which have been at both uh, local and national levels. And some groups have been slightly more militant, some have been more moderate, um, but the government has had to respond to and mitigate all of the demands whilst not interfering or upsetting the balance with the ASEAN and national political position, which, as Claire said, uh, respects uh, sovereignty and non-interference principles. So the government's answer to this has been to facilitate humanitarian aid, support refugees domestically and support Islamic NGOs working inside Indonesia and Myanmar. Um, and this is mitigated pressure within Indonesia um, but it's all been through ASEAN and bilateral ch channels. Um, and then the fourth set of values we found have influenced civil society, but not necessarily uh, the government's foreign policy towards Myanmar, which has been human rights and the RTP norm. Um, so yeah, these values have been felt most strongly in civil society who've been openly critical of the government for not doing more to protect the Rohingya um, in Myanmar and regionally. So again, the government's answer has been to provide humanitarian assistance and also to show solidarity to Muslim minority groups and engage in interfaith dialogue in Myanmar. Um, so whilst the government does show a level of commitment to RTP and human rights at an international level, they've not necessarily used the language of RTP um, in foreign policy and uh, they've more facilitated aid through ASEAN. So just to wrap up, um, we found that the, the three sets of values have had the most influence in formulating this middle way, this quiet diplomacy approach that Indonesia has taken towards Myanmar so far. These have been focused on aid, training of both military and government partners, opening cooperation, containing criticism within ASEAN and bilateral fora, and attempting to continue to build trust and keep channels open. That's been the key goal. Now that doesn't mean that the government of Indonesia is not committed to trying to do more to protect the Rohingya and reduce atrocities, more that they see that this is the best way to produce a long-term situation that's more conducive for them to return um, and for those that have remained within Myanmar for them to live more peaceably. Um, they're not going to do this via a more combative, legalistic or conflictual process. They want to focus on this trust building exercise via partnerships and aid and economic delivery. Remaining questions, of course, are around how effective this approach has been. Indonesian organizations do have better access, both um, within Rakhine State itself and via um, particular organizations than others in terms of providing aid. Diplomatic channels have been open as well as communications across the military. Um, does this directly resolve the roots of the conflict? Arguably not. On the other hand, it has potentially played an important role in reducing and mitigating some of the effects of the violence against that community, both inside and outside Myanmar. So on that note, um, we'll stop and hand over to Gareth. No, thank you for three interesting sets of analysis on, on, the, on the challenge. We have questions starting to come in. Please do put your questions using that question and answer function. And I should have mentioned at the start that this discussion is on the record. Let, let, let's go back. I mean, you were talking about the reaction from Indonesia. Some questions are coming in just about the broader international reaction. Um, the reaction in international organizations and an additional question, what could be done to make the issue more of a priority for other countries? I don't know if Claire, you want to come in on that, having expanding from Indonesia to other countries in ASEAN? Well, one interesting thing actually to note there is that Malaysia, which is the, the other Muslim majority state within ASEAN, has been much more vocal in its criticism of Myanmar. And um, one interesting thing for us to compare was, was why it is that Indonesia has taken a quieter approach to what um, has been called the megaphone diplomacy approach of, of Malaysia. Um, and, and we find there that the, the national interests that Indonesia is trying to balance um, have, have pushed it much more towards focusing on a humanitarian response rather than um, much more public and overt diplomatic criticism. 
um, of, the, of, of the case. So Malaysia has played a role in the OIC and the OIC has obviously been a very important um, organization behind the ICJ's um, case against um, Myanmar, which Ellen or, or others may want to reflect um, more on. But what's interesting is this isn't a West versus East situation at all. There's a great deal of divergence within Southeast Asian and Asian countries more broadly in terms of how they've responded to the crisis. Um, and some have actually said that the way Indonesia's responded has been quite in the lines of how some of the UN organizations and other Western governments have, re have responded in terms of, of playing this very quiet and diplomatic role. Um, so I think we see we don't see a West versus East response here at all. And indeed, there's been a lot of um, debate and contention between Muslim majority and Islamic states over how they should respond um, to the treatment of this Muslim minority group. Um, but I'm sure my colleagues have got more to offer there on the international um, position. I wonder, Vudabu, might you have some comments? You are certainly calling for a stronger approach. I mean, I, I guess the, the question is, what's effective versus what's feasible? So um, I actually, am, um, I think a little differently, I guess, uh, studying the conflict from, I guess, a different perspective uh, from Claire and uh, Susie, Susanna. Um, yeah, I think it's beyond, um, I, I think it's at this point, there should be more uh, a harder approach taken. So, um, for example, sanctions, um, I mean, there have been some sanctions placed. Um, one of the questions here, actually a comment was that some sanctions were placed, for example, on four um, Myanmar military officials um, and uh, in terms of travel um, or entry to the US. So the US put sanctions. Um, I think at this point, the, U, uh, the EU has been um, advocating about uh, sanctions on certain businesses that are operated by the Myanmar army. And every time, um, the, the Myanmar is a growing economy, we have to understand that, and there would be investments. And um, all major countries in the world have investments there. But every time somebody goes there and makes uh, investments, one should understand if it actually, how much is owned by the Myanmar army, uh, how much uh, it's owned by the people. So uh, we should probably make a distinction between the army and the people at this point, because um, the army has been carrying out ethnic cleansing and, um, and, and also had intentions of genocide. So that's all I can say at this point in time in terms of sanctions. I'm not, I wonder actually what Ellen would think about this, because, um, you know, this, it, it seems probably that uh, Ruda Bay um, has rather different position to to at least our research on this and I wonder where sorry to drag you in Ellen but I wonder what your response would be regarding international yeah. reactions to yeah. Myanmar well uh, I really don't know what now if we by international mean uh, western I don't really know what there is to do now because it's kind of to, I mean, one thing is, of course, humanitarian support to the refugees, that is obvious, but vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar, how much uh, influence do Western states or organizations have now? Um, I don't know. I mean, not much. I think, it's, I, I think it's kind of too late in a way. I think that something could have been done, particularly before the elections in 2015, because at the time... Uh, when sanctions were list, uh, lifted and uh, many countries decided to cancel their debt, uh, no, the Myanmar's debt to, to various Western nations, then, I mean, the issue of Rohingya citizenship, for example, could have been used. I, I mean, that could have been brought to the table, but many Western countries chose not to. And now, uh, what leverage do Western actors have vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar, I'm not sure. So there's a totally different dynamic now, but I think one thing that we can all do is to sort of call this by its name, which is, it's not a crisis. I mean, we wouldn't call Rwanda in 94 the crisis, the Rwanda crisis. And um, I think that this way of sort of treating this as something not so serious or something that sort of can be solved almost by sort of negotiation is, I mean, I, I think that that was possible maybe in 2016, but now it's something else. And it's, I think, uh, for any, I think any long-term solution just 
uh, has to sort of recognize the, the gravity of the atrocities that has been committed and, and it's, it's very difficult to, um, to envisage now that someone should be, other than the regional powers in Asia, should be able to, to push Myanmar to anything because they haven't really tried to do that before. Thank you. There are a couple of questions coming in about, um, broadly, the question of radicalization. Um, I'm not sure which of you might like to take that, the question of radicalization within the Rohingya that are left in Myanmar or those in camps in, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. Sure. Um, there are reports of radicalization, um, especially uh, within the camps. Um, and. Um, but uh, you know, it's how credible they are. That's something to think about. Um, but uh, of course, um, the ARSA is a reality, and um, that um, that has been a byproduct of years of violence against this uh, group of people who have been pushed to a corner, and this is a reaction to that. So. Um, and uh, ARSA, uh, we also know about the ARSA that's, uh, that's um, in public domain that they uh, get funding from international actors um, and, and, and uh, countries in the region um, mid from Middle East and, and, and Pakistan. Um, but um, how, how much they are in the camps, that's something uh, to probably for reporters to uh, still investigate because not, I mean, from my research, it's not, um, it's not something that we know as much uh, about uh, the ARSA being in the camps. Uh, they might be in the Rakhine state. Uh, there are still, um, one of the questions that I saw on the question answer tab is that uh, how many Rohingyas are left uh, in, in Myanmar? So uh, estimates of uh, about uh, 400,000 to half a million. Um, so within that population, ARSA may be there. So, uh, and ARSA is a reality, and uh, that's a byproduct of years of violence against this community. Yes, that's true. Claire, do you want to add something about Indonesia's concern regarding militancy? Well, I think that one of the, one of the issues that certainly drove um, the Indonesian government to respond via uh, first recognizing the Rohingya as refugees, which they didn't at first when they started arriving um, on boats in Aceh province, and then in terms of facilitating access um, for Islamic organizations who wanted to provide aid, both within Rakhine State and to the camps in Bangladesh and the uh, arriving refugees in Indonesia itself, was this worry about rising militancy within Indonesia. So these small um, uh, militant groups that were putting pressure on, on um, putting pressure on the government in relation to this situation. So um, pacifying those groups and responding to more moderate organizations, um, calling for the provision of aid and, and so forth has certainly played a role in their response. And that's one of the key tensions that they had to face. They had to do something because they had to respond to this, you know, significant domestic pressure, but at the same time without um, Without, without doing so in such a way that Myanmar would close the doors and, um, and that would be seen as, as being done in a suitably ASEAN-like way. Um, I, I, I have le much less information about the militancy outside Indonesia in terms of, of how it's been operating um, in uh, Myanmar itself or in the borders, um, but that's certainly a concern of ASEANs and wanting to reduce that, secu that security threat whether it's been used, as some people say, as, as a way to, to launch attacks against um, the Rohingya is, is perhaps another part of the story um, and more to do with Myanmar politics. If, if I could take the liberty of paraphrasing a couple of the questions around the situation for Rohingya left in Myanmar, um, potentially, is, is, there, is there a solution for the Rohingya outside of Myanmar, for those from those who are still within Myanmar, I don't know if Ellen, if you might speak to that. Well, I uh, I think it's really important in this um, the situation we are in now with such a huge refugee population in Bangladesh to to keep up. Uh, to keep the attention to to those left in Myanmar also, and we, I mean, the, there has been. 
uh, I mean, as you know, with the, the other military conflict in Rakhine state, it's, it's really difficult with humanitarian access. And um, I don't know, it's, it's a, we now have this order from the International Court of Justice, right, that states that those Rohingya left in Myanmar are under threat of genocide. And I think that's, you know, it's a fair um, statement. I think that it's very, in a very um, difficult situation. And, and we should, I mean, sometimes I get a feeling from some of the discussions, particularly the discussions about accountability, that we're sort of, we are now in a sort of post-crisis situation where we have to address the crimes of the past as if it's not still going on. Uh, so I think within that context, and particularly when we're in discussions about accountability and about sort of when it's the time for justice and how to achieve justice, I think it's really important to, to, to remind ourselves that of all these Rohingya left in Myanmar and that they are under extreme threat, actually. We have a question, um, I think, aimed at you, Rudiver, um, how COVID has exacerbated human trafficking in the region. Um, Previous reports have highlighted the rise in exploitation of refugees in Bangladesh. Are there any measures in place to prevent or protect victims? No, COVID has been an excuse, unfortunately, uh, for a lot of um, countries, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, I mean, the Rohingyas, they have, uh, there were uh, cases even before this COVID crisis, especially in 2015, where they were on boats trying to get to uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, mainly uh, Malaysia. Um, I mean, even last week, um, in the, some um, some Rohingyas uh, landed in 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 uh, Indonesia. So, um, but uh, Malaysian authorities uh, during this time they have not allowed a lot of uh, boats to enter their territories, unfortunately, and uh, that has been in the news during the summer. Um, in, in terms of Bangladesh, yes, it's a reality that, uh, you know, certain human trafficking groups are operating in the camps that's, uh, that's out in public domain. So we know that, and I'm sure they're making good use of this situation where a vulnerable population is even more vulnerable. We have a lot of questions which we can't get through, but one which I think sums up quite a lot of the issues. What, what are your ideas for a durable solution? Um, maybe we'll start with you, Claire. Well, as I, th as I think we outlined, we, our research has very much been focused on what the role of Indonesia has been both bilaterally and with um, ASEAN. And one reflection that I think, um, you know, I'd like to make here is that that's just one part of the puzzle. It's an enormous, enormous problem. I think as Ellen was outlining, it's um, in, in what Rudabe was saying about the scale and the size of the problem. And most of um, the refugees are in Bangladesh, and we now have almost a state within a state, if you think about the size of the population that's, that's living in the camps there. And this is a problem that's going to affect the Asian region for the next 50, 75 or so years. This isn't a, an, you know, anything that will be resolved quickly. So it needs every, every possible solution being used on it. It may be that some states work best via a quiet diplomatic approach, that enables them to have access. It means they can keep talking to the military. It means that they can keep talking to the government about potentially reducing the way the, the violence that they've been carrying out against this group. It's certainly the case that for other states, they could play a much more effective role in pushing harder in terms of um, accountability, international legal accountability, um, and those sorts of mechanisms. And for other states, providing humanitarian assistance is going to be absolutely essential to maintain the, or it's ho hopefully improve the living conditions of those who've been forced to flee. Um, so I think that you, we have to think on every level and across all of these different organizations, there's, I don't think there's one simple solution, but it has to be addressed um, you know, multilaterally and via all these different forums. But certainly what we've seen politically, and I think Ellen was highlighting this, is that the, the Southeast Asian states have a key role to play and how they are able to access um, Myanmar and to talk to it as a friend and ally is very important. And I think the EU and other states need to work much more closely with ASEAN states in, in dealing with this. Uh, there's also the, the question, of course, of China 
and China's interests, and China has played a role in facilitating peace processes with other ethnic armed organizations within Myanmar, um, and, uh, and certainly not in publicly criticizing Myanmar in its approach here. So the Asian states have to think in terms of negotiating with and balancing um, China's role too. Um, so that's not a neat answer, but I think it reflects the gravity of the, of the, of the problem here. Ellen, can I yeah. ask you what you think a durable <laughs> solution might be and how we might get there? Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm not optimistic. I think that for the foreseeable future, there will be a huge refugee population of stateless people in Bangladesh. That's, that's just the reality of the situation. I, I can't see how, I mean, there will be some repatriation, I think, and that will be used as sort of a whitewash for the, by the Myanmar government. They will say that they say, look, we are accepting, there will be this very slow uh, processes of some sort of verification of, of the identity of some of the refugees and they will be they will be resettled in some kind of camps maybe in Myanmar. I mean, that's what's happening, right? They're building camps for them. Uh, but on a larger scale, I, I don't see that. Uh, I mean, I don't see this happening, but um, I think it's important to to sort of take a step back and look at, as, as I said in my introduction at the some of the root causes and this ethno-nationalism and this link between ethnicity and citizenship and to also remind ourselves that this uh, notion of citizenship in Myanmar is, I mean, it, it's created at some point, right? It's not <laughs> given or it's not like a force of nature. It doesn't have to build that way. So, and it's based on, on how, uh, partly on, on the colonial history, but also on how the state was was constructed after independence, right? And then this this talk of the unity of the 135 uh, or the different ethnic uh, national groups was sort of created, and it's this historical myth that that there's that the, the territory of Myanmar has this long history. Um, so when you can create a myth like that, maybe you can create another truth like that that Myanmar should be more inclusive and that other people can belong and it has been possible for other minorities to to get citizenship so so it's not impossible but I think it, it, it's I mean any solution sort of short of of discussing uh, this link between citizenship and ethnicity will will just put Rohingya in in danger again I think Luda but last word to you um if you could Put forward your ideas on durable solutions and another question that just caught my eye on the proposal to move the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh to the Bashanshah Island if you had any reaction to that um okay so um I have like you know probably a minute to answer this um so I completely agree with Ellen that uh, unless and until uh, Myanmar changes it when they got independence uh, that is when uh, there would be um, there would be a solution to this crisis, and people would have the surety that they can go back and get their uh, citizenship. And citizenship is linked to livelihood and property, and so on. Uh, in terms of the Bhashan Chor um, issue, um, it's um, yeah, it um, it's 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 a very iffy question. I mean. Uh, in, in the West, this has uh, received a lot of negative uh, attention. There is also questionable how, um, how um, sustainable that island is. So I haven't been to that island, so I cannot talk about it. There are many different types of uh, media reports in Bengali and um, also in English. Uh, so um, the Bangladesh Navy claims that it is, um, it is liv livable. So um, I think, on the other hand, I think that instead of the Bhashanchar uh, issue, I think one would be thinking of third country resettlements uh, because uh, that issue has received so much negative attention that even if the Rohingyas actually go there, uh, it would look like um, they have been pressurized to some extent. Um, and uh, the third country um, uh, topic, which uh, you know one can learn from from neighboring Bhut uh, Nepal. I mean, with the Bhutanese uh, refugees uh, that was in the, there in the 90s. I think that's uh, one study that one should definitely look at and see how uh, international um, community 
uh, could convince some of the Western countries, such as the UK and the US, to accept some of the refugees. And I, as I said before, that's a very uh, small number, 100,000. We're looking at 100 million or more, uh, sorry, a million or more now. But um, we should look at successful cases and learn from that. Thank you. Well, I mean, from your comments, it's, it's an issue that we'll continue to focus on, and it's an issue that's not going to go away. Um, it leaves me just to thank all of our panelists and thank you um, for a, a large number of participants. Apologies for a few technical issues on my side um, and apologies again for not being able to get through all of the questions, but I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.